you know, you never know how something's going to turn out the first time you try it. And uh, we just thought, let's, uh, let's get the church body together for communion. Um, and uh, I was praying about this yesterday, and it's so easy to get distracted with details when you go to a new place and you try something different. Um, I mean, one thing the elders were together on was we need to get serious about devoting ourselves to the Lord's Supper. It's just something we see in Scripture. It's something we see in that early church, and we want to just have a real reverent time coming before the body and blood of Jesus. And yet when we get together in a, in a place like this where we've never been, it's weird, and you have a, a different group, and uh, you kind of don't know where to sit, you know, do we put all the Chinese over here? Um, where, wh like, how do we mix this up and, and everything else? But again, like for myself, I'm like, okay, this is, this is, this is a little strange. Um, we've never done this before, but I don't want to get caught up in the details. So yesterday I was praying, um, because it's very easy to come to a gathering like this and not think about loving other people. Like when I was looking at the Lord's Supper and I was reading in, in John, in the context of the Lord's Supper in John chapter 13, starting in verse 12, it says, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. I want you to imagine for a second, I mean, what if this was what, the, like a setting where Christ himself in the flesh, Christ in the flesh, try to imagine right now Jesus washing your feet. Okay, in fact, right now, just, just close your eyes for a second. And could you imagine your creator, the Son of God, coming down in the flesh, taking your shoes off, and him washing your feet? Imagine the disciples who saw him perform so many miracles. They saw him walk on water, raise the dead, and now he's about to die for them. But before he does that, before he goes to the cross, he, he, he walks to each disciple and just starts washing their feet. And now you understand why Peter's like, no, you don't wash my feet. You're my creator. You're God. You don't wash my feet. And Jesus, if you don't let me do this, you have no place, you have no part in me. Like Jesus washing our feet, the creator, I just think, could there be anything more awkward, more unfitting than the king washing our feet? And then Jesus' words were, okay, now that I've done that to you, I want you to do that to one another. He goes, this was an example. He goes, like the verse says, he goes, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So I'm praying about this, going, God, okay, we did not come here so that you could have a great experience. We did not come here so that I could have a great experience. We came here saying, God, we want to honor you, right? 
That's why we gather, is that, God, we want you to be honored. And so I'm reading the scriptures going, God, what would honor you most as your children come together? And that passage is pretty clear that we should come in with this idea of loving one another, serving one another. Like if we're trying to honor him, and I, and I, I was just ashamed because I thought, how many times have I come into a church gathering without the thought of serving the other people there and loving them? We get caught up in just getting here on time, the awkwardness or whatever, just thinking about different things. Some of us were stuck. Some of us, you know, here's the Son of God saying, look, if I can wash your feet, I think you guys can go around and serve one another. If I, the Lord, wash your feet, he says, I'm not asking you to gather to wash my feet. Jesus didn't say, okay, now you guys take turns and wash my feet. He says, I want you to wash one another's feet now because I gave this as an example to you. And so I want you to think, like, when you came here this morning, did the thought of loving others even enter your mind? Did you walk in the room going, who can I bless? Who can I serve? God, use me to love on people today. Is that the attitude you came in with? Because sometimes, I know some of us just get stuck. We don't even know it. Like, I get caught up in myself, in my own mind. Like, sometimes I don't realize how self-centered I am. And I'll show up to the church gathering. I'll show up to communion thinking about myself rather than taking the example of Christ who came. He was, that the whole Lord's Supper was about him dying for us and then him washing the feet of the disciples and he says okay as i thought about god how do you want to be worshiped and we're thinking through the service and what do we want to do and do we start off with a song do we start off with this do, you know how do we start this and it's like lord what do you want because sometimes we think worship is singing we're gonna start worship now so let's sing. Once the guitar gets going, oh, okay, it's worship time. But we're just thinking, you know what would honor God the most is if we worshiped him by actually loving each other. And I know we live in a different culture now where the washing of the feet doesn't mean the same thing. It's not something we do here. But there's other ways that we can serve each other. It's maybe looking someone in the eyes and actually caring when you say, how are you doing? And maybe when you find out what the struggle is that you would actually be one that fixes the situation with your resources and time or with your prayers. And I wanna, I wanna have a time of actually loving one another by worshiping God, worshiping God, by just maybe even going up to a stranger in this room that you don't even know, or maybe the Holy Spirit will lead you to a specific person and just minister to one another. Um, however the Holy Spirit leads you. But I want you to spend some time praying because the Bible says we've all been given gifts from the Holy Spirit. And the point of those gifts were to minister to one another, to bless each other. That if you came with a heart like, I want to bless someone by the power of the Spirit today. And so I wanna pray for you because I know some of you have been stuck, stuck in your own head. Some of you have been obsessed with thinking about things this week that have nothing to do with the cross. See, this is what the communion table was all about, was like whatever you've been thinking about, this is bigger than that. 
I promise you it's bigger than that. Whatever you're obsessed with right now, this is bigger. Some of you, the enemy has you angry about something. This is the time to let it go. Some of you, the enemy has you fearful. Some of you, the enemy has you anxious and worried about something. For some of you, you come today and you're ashamed of something. All these things keep you from really enjoying the presence of Christ. All these things keep you from loving other people. Some of you, maybe you're, you're, you come with a critical spirit. And, man, I want to pray for you. That you come going, okay, I'm going to see if Francis says anything wrong today. I'm just coming, li- rather than with a heart to just love people and pour your life out for others. And I'm going to pray for that. But right now, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to pray for yourself. Ask God to give you supernatural love for the people in this room by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Father, we come in this room to worship you and we need your spirit, Lord. I need your spirit right now even to pray as I ought with the reverence and fear I should have for you, the love and the confidence. God, we need your spirit. And right now, Father, you command us to love one another. This is your new command. This is how we abide in you, by loving one another. So, Father, I ask right now, by the power of your almighty Holy Spirit, God, would he change us, God? Take away the self-centeredness, God, right now, and give us a Holy spiritual, Holy Spirit supernatural love for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's honor the Lord right now by taking the next 10 minutes or so and just loving on each other however the Spirit calls you to do that. If it's just going up to someone and just saying, can I pray for you, or or being honest with your own struggles and allowing others to bless you by praying. Um, But let's, let's take some time, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's just talk to one another, fellowship with one another, minister to one another. And then uh, I'll come back in like 10 minutes.
All right, let's, uh, let's, let's head back to our seats. Um, uh, you know, as I was, I was praying about this yesterday, um, I was thinking about how there's so many things that can divide us today, right? And what's crazy to me is that communion itself, which was meant to bring the body together, it's the very thing that divides a lot of believers from each other. I go, gosh, how satanic is that? That the death of Christ that was supposed to make us perfectly one and coming to the table with one bread, one piece of bread was supposed to signify his body being one. And yet, Nowadays, some of you, we, we come from different backgrounds, right? I don't know how you did communion growing up, but some of you would walk in this room and, and, and think about all the ways that the enemy could divide us right now. Okay, Jesus who died to make us perfectly one. And yet some come from a tradition where, where I, there's, a, there's a liturgy that I'm supposed to say over the bread and cup. Otherwise, there's no blessing in it. Some of you, you're going, well, that's not even unleavened bread. That, that has yeast in it. We, we don't do that in our tradition. Some of you come in, you're going, wait, you got these little plastic cups with these, these wafers, so it's not even coming from one bread. And in my tradition, we had one loaf and we all drank from the same cup. You know, and, and, and so you, you, there's so many things right now. You're going, well, because what if I said this morning, hey, we're all going to drink from the same cup, <laughs> right? Immediately, some of you guys would leave, right? There's no way, or you would pass. There's no way you're going to do it. Then others say, okay, if you're going to pray over that bread and you believe it turns into the body and blood of Jesus, then I want no part in that. Others would say, well, if you just think that's a symbol and there's nothing to it, I don't want any part of that. Do you see how crazy this gets? You know, and I, I was thinking, Lord, what do I even bring? Because I've been studying, and some of the elders, we've been studying together. Like, you know, We Our Church was all about this book, right? Where, where we go, when I read this book and what this book says about the church, it is very different from what I experience. Right? We wrestled with that. We're going, gosh, I read this in this book. When did it become a service that you just attend for an hour, sing for 30 minutes, listen to a sermon for 40 minutes, and then go home? When did that transition happen? Because I don't see that in the scriptures. I see this family. I saw these people that were committed to one another. And so we, our, our whole fight, and we continue to strive and fight imperfectly. Man, I want you to know we have imperfect elders at We Are Church. We are imperfect. And, but we're striving, going, gosh, we want this. We want to do this as biblically as possible. And so whenever we see something, then we go, gosh, I don't know if we're doing this right. We study the scriptures. We look at church history. We go, what, what was it like back then? Because we all know they didn't have all of this and a stage and a 40-minute sermon out of the New Testament. They didn't have a New Testament. They didn't have a Bible for 300 years. So what did they do? You know, we're so used to waking up, having our devotions, reading the scripture. But what did they do back then when you, most people couldn't even read? And if they could read, they don't have a Bible. I mean, that didn't come for hundreds of years later. And so a lot of things we do, we go, okay, well, let's take advantage of the opportunities we have. But at the same time, we go back and go, what did they do? So Christ ascends into heaven 
What do the believers do? Paul goes to a new city, explains the gospel to them in a couple weeks, and then he goes to the next place. What did those believers do? They don't have a Bible. They don't have a preacher. They just learned about Jesus. This is what they did. Communion was central. Communion was so precious to them because what the apostles passed on was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. It was something that they did in their homes. That's why it says in Acts 2.42 that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. They were devoted to this. Some of us have been devoted to prayer. You know, in Acts 2.42, it has, it has those four things where he says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. This was their devotion. They want to know, what have the apostles taught us? What do we learn from them? They were devoted to loving one another. This was the fellowship. We are going to become a family. We're going to become perfectly one. I'm devoted to this. I'm devoted to prayer. Like, and I hope you still get excited about praying because this, this, is, this is what happens over time. It's like, hey, let's pray. You just kind of close your eyes like it's no big deal. I'm like, is this no big deal to you to talk to the one who's keeping you alive? And communion is one of those things where we can lose our fascination, and maybe you've never even had it. But I encourage you, study it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Study it yourself. What did those early believers believe about the bread and the cup? They all believed that there was some sort of mysterious presence of God, that there was something special when the believers gathered together in unity, they believed that Christ's real presence was somehow, and we're not going to fight about exactly how or when it happens or how it happens and exactly to what extent this is the body and blood of Christ. Okay, let's not divide. But they were in agreement for 1,500 years that there was a real presence of Christ in the elements. And when the elements were prayed over, something happened. And I, I was sitting down just going, God, how can I even pray a prayer that won't be divisive? How can I even lead this in a way that unites the body? Because you, you, we read in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, when you gather together, it's not for the better, but it's for the worst. He goes, because when you gather for the breaking of bread, he goes, I hear there are divisions among you. He says, you know what? Just don't even do it. If you're going to come divided, please don't take of this. He goes, don't you understand? The very celebration is how Christ made us one. And, and so when, you know, back then when they had different, well, I'm rich, you're not, I'm successful, you're not, I'm more intelligent than you. It's, it's just like all these divisions. Guys, man, some of you may have a better understanding of the Eucharist than I do. Some of you are bothered that I even use the word the Eucharist because it just sounds too Catholic to you. And call it the Lord's Supper. Call it communion. Call it the breaking of bread. Call it... 
You see all the things the Lord wants to do? And all of that keeps us from just being blown away. I mean, if Jesus was in this room and we had the opportunity one at a time to walk up to Jesus, what would you be thinking? I, I, we would be fascinated, right? And all the things that would normally divide us of, oh no, Francis isn't wearing a mask. It's okay, I read up on it. If you're the guy in the front, it's okay. As long as there's a distance, okay? And that's why we gave you little cups. We're just like, hey, let's, let's make this as painless as possible because we don't want any distractions. But normally, you know, should we show, have a show of hands of who's vaccinated and who's not? We can fight about that. You want to show hands who thinks we should recall the governor and who shouldn't? You want to have a, there are so many things to fight about right now. But the presence of Christ when you believe the Son of God is in our midst and you really believe that at one point I was his enemy and I could be in hell right now suffering for all of eternity. But God so loved this world that he had his son, the word, who was with him in the beginning, become flesh and take the form of a man, a servant, and subjected himself to death, even death on a cross, so that we could be forgiven. And then he rose again And he tells us in John chapter 15, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. that Jesus says we could abide in him right now. That right now, this very second, he wants to abide with us. And he says that abiding will happen as you obey my command. And my command is this, that you love one another just as I have loved you. A few weeks ago, the elders and, our, and the elders' wives got together and we had a time of communion. Just a time to fellowship with each other, love one another. And then we spent like two hours before taking of the bread and cup, just confessing sin, just bowing down in reverence, just weeping before the Lord in his presence. And then we broke bread. Then we took of the cup. And then 
afterwards, one of the persons there asked for healing. Can we pray for healing? And so we laid hands on her and prayed, and she was immediately healed. I thought, whoa. I mean, it was awesome. It was awesome. And then a few days later in our gathering in EPA, again, let's continue on this theme of, of reverence and sacredness before the body and blood of Christ. And again, we experienced miracles. Like, like I just walked away going, whoa, that was the craziest service I've been a part of. That was amazing. And then other times we took of communion and I've been leading it in different places because I am just obsessed. This is like, this is like my favorite thing to do on earth now. I know that sounds weird to some of you, but I'm going, no, the early church, they were obsessed with this because there was some real way that they were communing with God. That's why we call it communion. We say these words, we don't even think about what, what we're talking about, this unity you can have with Christ at the table. It's different from everything else. And I'm telling you, I've had these intimate times with God where it's not just me talking about him, but it's like, oh, Jesus, it's like you're right here. And yesterday, what the Lord was speaking to me was he was showing me times when, you know, because I saw those miracles, those times when we took a communion. So then there were other times we would take a communion and I'm waiting for a miracle. And almost disappointed that I didn't see any miracles that morning. And yet when I look back, I go, but Jesus, I had such a great, you know, like I'm sobbing at times, like this intimate time with God. And he was showing me yesterday that sometimes I get distracted. I get distracted by these miracles. And it, it's easy to chase miracles rather than chasing the presence of God and intimacy with him. And I was going, wow, I had such sweet, sweet moments with you. And I want that. I want that more than the miracles. It's kind of like, well, my cousin is here today, and when we were growing up, every once in a while, Grandma would come from Hong Kong and visit. You remember she'd always like pass out $100 bills, and pretty soon, like as a teenage kid or 10-year-old kid, getting a $100 bill, it's like, wow, that was awesome. And sometimes, you know, they'd go gamble and win more, and then we'd get more $100 bills. And so pretty soon, guess what my thought was when grandma is coming from Hong Kong? Uh, yeah, how much am I going to get this time? Just in my own greed and selfishness, rather than, oh, cool, grandma's going to be here. And God was just showing me, you can be that way with my presence, too. Yeah, I'll distribute gifts as I choose, but don't get lost in those. Enjoy my presence with you. And that's my prayer today, is that all of you would just have the most intimate time with him whether he heals you or not, whether he gives you a supernatural gift or not, the greatest gift is his presence with us. That's what they came together to celebrate, was he is present. Don't let this get old to you. I mean, if I told you Jesus is going to be here today and you could touch him, some of you, if I said, okay, but the only way you can touch him is if you walk here. 
man, I, coming from Fremont or San Francisco, if I knew I could touch Jesus and I just had to walk to Redwood City, I would do it in a heartbeat. If I could shake his hand, if I could hold him, if I could touch him. See, there was some mystery in communion of the real presence. Why, that's, why, that's why I go, wow, this is what I am most excited about. It's like, wow, this communing, this abiding, it's his body, his blood. Something special happened. And that's why you see, you remember the story in Luke 24, after Christ rose from the dead, and he's walking with those, those strangers are, are, are walking on, uh, and it says that very day, verse 13, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that happened. While they were walking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation you're, you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in, th in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, as the women had said, but they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, then they told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. It's a fascinating story, right? Jesus walks up to these two guys that witness everything, and he says he explained all of the scriptures to them, but they still didn't know who he was. Isn't that crazy? Jesus himself was teaching them better than anyone on earth could teach them, explained everything from Moses through all the prophets and explained why Jesus had to die. And they, they're just going, wow, that was amazing, that's amazing, that's amazing. They get to the house, they don't recognize him. Then the moment he breaks the bread, something happens. Something happened in the breaking of the bread there was some, that's why these early believers 
were devoted to this because they're saying there's something that happens. Jesus prayed and then the bread broke and then there was something. This is how, you know, Paul says, this is the way you declare his death until he returns. This is how, the way we proclaim it. The way we proclaim it is not, let's get the best speaker to explain the gospel. No, because Jesus himself was explaining the gospel on the road to Emmaus. It was just when he broke the bread, there was something that happened. When he blessed that bread and that cup and he began it, suddenly their eyes were opened. That's why the early church looked at this and said, okay, Jesus said, this is, this is my body broken for you. There was something real about this. So I'm going to pray for these elements. And I'm just telling you right now, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm reading a lot of things, a lot of history. It's a mystery to me. I don't know if when I pray, there's some who believe that this bread actually transforms and it literally becomes flesh and blood, even though it still looks like bread and juice. Others say, no, it's not till you take it and it comes into your body. Others say, no, when you pray over it, the real presence of Christ enters into the elements, but there's still the elements. Look, you guys, I don't know. And I'm reading different things about how these people repeated this prayer over and over, and then other people repeated this prayer over and over. And then 500 years ago, someone popularized, no, nothing happens to it. I lean towards something mysterious happens, but is it okay if I just pray and go, God, I don't know, but I want everything that can happen, I want it to happen. God, I want every bit of communing with you. If this is going to turn into your flesh and blood in my body, then I want that. If, if this turns into your flesh and blood, whatever you want, God, like my mind is so limited. You know all things. And I'm just going to pray over these elements and say, God, whatever you want to do, we want as much of you as our human bodies can handle. And if it's sacrilegious to you for this to become something different, then don't do that. Do you know, like we don't know. How am I supposed to know 2,000 years ago exactly how Christ wanted it when there are so many people who are questioning? Can we just pray in faith and say, God, would you do whatever you want to do to this bread, this cup, the bread and cup that you hold, whenever you do it, however you do it, to what extent you do it, Lord, we surrender to you. We come humbly going, God, how could we possibly know outside the power of your Holy Spirit, but in a spirit of unity and love for one another, God, we just humbly come and surrender to your omniscience, to your wisdom, to your power. So I'm going to pray for God's presence. And then we'll just spend some time singing to him about his presence here with us. And then we'll take of the bread and cup in a little bit. But um, right now, if you would just pray with me. Father in heaven, we join the angels 
who have been worshiping you all night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God, you are holy. You've existed forever. You are holy. You are so far beyond all of us. Holy are you, holy are you, holy are you, God. You were from eternity past. God, we've only existed for a few years. You are eternal. You always will be. And you are here with us now. And so we humble ourselves, God, before your, your almighty, holy presence. God, we surrender our finite minds. We're ashamed of thinking we're more intelligent than someone else in this room because we've studied more, that our, our minds are capable of more. What? That is so ridiculous, Lord. You possess all truth and our only hope of knowing truth is asking you, God, speak to us, please. And God, we don't know exactly how to do this perfectly, God. God, we don't want to do this casually. Like it's just ordinary bread and juice. God, we're remembering the Son of God, our Savior. And we want to do it, Lord, with hearts of reverence and thanksgiving and fascination, God. We want to abide in you right now. And we want every bit of your blessing, Lord. We are so thankful for this bread and this cup. And God, we are asking for as much of you as possible. We want to encounter you in your presence. And we ask that you do whatever you see fit to this bread and this cup but we believe you can do anything. If you could become flesh and blood and be implanted into the womb of a virgin, then you can certainly turn bread and a cup into anything you want. And we just humble ourselves before your almighty mind and your power and surrender as your children and say, God, you know, only you possess all truth. And we ask for a blessing on these elements that we're going to partake of. And give us faith to believe in your presence in this room with us right now. that as we sing to you, may we sing in faith. Give us faith to believe that you are in this room with us and that you hear these words that we sing in adoration to you. Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body. 
is my body broken for you. Jesus, we're doing this in remembrance of you. We remember when your body was broken for us. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Father, because the body was broken for us that we could become one with you and one with each other. We worship you for the cup of the new covenant. The blood of our Savior. That covers our sins his real blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. When he took the wrath of God on our behalf, when he, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Jesus is in this room with us. Our Father abides with us. His Spirit dwells in us because of the cross. And we have come here today, Father, to worship you and to remember you and what you did. Thank you for your great act of love. And now, Father, we want to commune with you in the deepest way possible. If you have examined yourself, and you have gotten rid of any bitterness or any division towards the body of Christ, if you believe that Jesus really was the Son of God who became flesh and died on the cross to pay for your sins so that you could be brought near to God right now, if that's you, then take the bread And let's take and eat of it together. And if you believe that the blood of Christ was poured out for our sins and you trust in his blood for your salvation, then all of you drink of it.
Father, we want everything to revolve around you. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Oh, Father, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.